Hey everyone, we're gonna get started. Thanks. Um, so we're about to begin our second panel. Uh, the focus of this panel is transportation, uh, bicycle and pedestrian transportation, as well as urban and public transportation. Um, we have a really great lineup of speakers from the city, uh, from the state, and from the nonprofit sector, as well as advocacy organizations. Um, we're gonna start with Nicole Scott Harris, who is joining us from the New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance. Uh, we have Hannah Cockburn, who is with NCDOT, the Bicycle and Pedestrian Division. Um, next, after that, we're gonna hear from Ellen Beckman with the city of Durham, uh, Karen Ringe with Wake Up Wake County, and Patrick McDonough with uh, Go Triangle. Um, so I'm gonna let you guys uh, introduce yourselves and uh, we'll have a few short presentations as well. Thanks everybody. Hi, um, good morning, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Nicole Scott Harris. I work for New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance. I'll give you a brief biography just so you understand what my education is and what my point of reference is um, <coughs> and my professional experience as well. So I hold a bachelor's degree in sociology and African American studies from Rutgers University as well as a, bachelor's, a master's degree in political science from Rutgers University. I was a fellow with an institute at Rutgers called the Eagleton Institute of Politics, which does a lot of polling and stuff. They have a good program there that's like a national model for women in politics called the Center for American Women in Politics, where they run a program called Ready to Run every year, different things like that. Um, I also have a bachelor's of science in nutrition and dietetics, and I'm in the process of studying to receive my um, credentials, so I plan to take the exam before Thanksgiving. So that's another um, aspect of, of my worldview and my professional perspective that I bring um, to this lens. Um, I worked as a congressional aide uh, for a, a former member of Congress in New Jersey. Um, I also worked for a labor union in New York City, a national labor union, doing work in New York City and Memphis, Vermont, went to Massachusetts, dif different places. And um, I also worked for New Jersey Democratic Party for a period of time, a different stage in my life. And um, now I work for New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance and I do environmental justice advocacy and engagement with stakeholders, including government, community, um, you know, when I say government, I mean elected officials as well as policy makers because elected officials and policy makers can sometimes be two different people. Um, and also some more and more industry because we have to talk to each other. And, um, you know, whoever, whoever that we might encounter, community folks, every, you know, the like. So when um, I was contacted about being involved with this, moving panel and transportation of um, the lens that I bring to this conversation is around the movement of our stuff. Um, so a lot of times we don't really think about this even though Amazon is a behemoth. So if we don't understand like how important our stuff is, just look at you know the precipitous growth of and power scary power of uh, my, per my personal opinion of Amazon and, and Jeff Bezos and the overlap of, um, you know, he owns the media, Whole Foods, Amazon, which started off as a books company and now does everything. Um, and also they have contracts with the United States government. So it's, it's um, extremely concerning. Uh, they, they just had a we were talking about this yesterday at dinner, uh, a race to the bottom competition with a lot of cities vying for Amazon <coughs> to select them as their second headquarters location, where cities were offering all kinds of crazy tax incentives um, or pilot type of uh, mechanisms to incentivize Amazon to come there. Obviously on the backs of their residents, Nork was one of them, and um, as far as I know, I don't think we're in the running anymore, and I'm pretty happy about that, although I don't know if that's a, a popular opinion. Um, but um, because of our logistics uh, requirements and our culture around consumption, there are certain communities around the United States, of which Nork is one, that um, bear the brunt of 
our trade deficits and the disproportionate environmental and health impacts related to the movement of these goods and how we consume them, how we acquire them, the like. It, and when I say goods, I mean everything from fossil fuels to food. I mean, and sometimes that's the same industry, um, interestingly enough. But it it, it goes from we're produce we're importing more than half of our produce from other countries in the United States um, to you know where we get cars from, where we get every where we get everything from, our clothes, every single thing, and um, the communities that have to bear the brunt of this logistics infrastructure end up dealing with lots of pollution re related to. The on-port pollution created by the equipment on the ports that move things around, um, the truck traffic, whether it be um, like truck idling or trucks actually waiting at the port for their pickups or drop-offs because they're not always the most efficient system. Um, I do, I do want to go back to this slide, though, just to make sure I'm saying everything. So. Just a little background for New Jersey. New Jersey is, has the third largest port in the nation behind Long Beach. And, um, ooh, I just went through the whole thing. <laughs> through um, Long Beach, I mean, uh, after Long Beach and Los Angeles, um, we have the 15th busiest airport in the nation. Actually, Newark Airport is closer than LaGuardia and JFK to Manhattan. So a lot of people fly into Newark Airport if they're trying to get to Manhattan fast. That's one of the quickest ways to get there. Um, then uh, it's like the, I think the third largest hub for United, which is like the busiest airline in the United States, and then the second largest hub for FedEx. Um, and so you just think about the, not only the amount of people that are coming there and the pollution related to the jet fuel, but also the amount of goods and that stuff coming there. Then, um, at the port is the third largest port behind Los Angeles and, um, and Long Beach. And so we're the biggest port or the largest port on the East Coast, but the third largest in the country. And um, as a result of that, obviously there's trucks, a concentration of truck traffic and highways in North. It's interesting because I'm an 80s baby to get some a historical context more for understanding um, the U.S. highway system, how it developed, which I knew a little bit about because they have uh, historic history in North called the North Riots that sort of came out of a lot of that um, redevelopment and stuff like that. Um, warehouses, not only the trucks that um, come with the warehouses, but the poor labor standards that are often associated with them and, um, you know, lack of financial stability of the individuals who tend to frequent those kind of jobs. A lot of those jobs are Amazon jobs. I don't know if you guys have Amazon um, factories down here or warehouses. Um, and the Bayonne Bridge, which was something that was a big project that happened in New York in New York and New Jersey um, to raise the bridge to a level high enough in order to accommodate Panamanic ships, or if I'm saying it right. The, they widened the uh, Panama Canal in order to be able to make these massively uh, huge ships to be able to move through them and also to be able to bring it to New Jersey. They raised the Bayonne Bridge. In the process of doing that, they, you know, some, process, some regulatory steps got skipped over, like uh, environmental impacts assessment, health impacts assessments, because uh, one, of my, one of my main interests in politics is around political transparency and accountability. And anytime you're dealing with big money and big projects, and there's always a possibility for people to hide things um, and you for, for you really not to understand what's completely going on. So things happen behind the scenes all the time. Developers have relationships with this person or that person or this elected official, and they're able to get certain things expedited, certain things stalled, um, certain things skipped over. Uh, and so with the Bayonne Bridge, there were certain regulatory steps or processes that we would have liked to see that did not happen, we think, because there's money interest involved. 
and I definitely, but that's definitely what I believe. And we actually sued the Port Authority. Um, so we, New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance, and I'll go to the next slide, belongs to a coalition called the Coalition for Healthy Ports, and we sued the Port Authority, which we were unsuccessful in, around um, the Army Corps and, and different people saying that they didn't need to do these uh, particular types of things. And lastly, before I go to the next slide, I do want to mention these trains. So trains do move stuff. They're cleaner than most of the trucks. Um, and one of the main things, though, to be concerned about with these trains and people not understanding what's coming through their neighborhoods is these bomb trains carrying combustible materials, driving through densely populated areas. And you want to talk about density. New Jersey is the most densely populated state in the country. And we li I live just outside of New York City, which is the area of New Jersey that is the densest. Um, so we, we know about density. And so anything that happens there in, um, in these environmental impacts and health impacts affect a significant amount of people because we have more people there per you know, square uh, mile than you know, anywhere else in this country in terms of the level of concentration, especially around, when I say the tri-state, I mean like New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, that area mostly, not so much the, the uh, South Jersey, Philadelphia area. Not that they don't have their toxics too. And then New Jersey is one of the original 13 colonies, so uh, it has a, a long industrial legacy. And um, as a result of that, so it's kind of like, it was one of the original 13 colonies, but at the same time, um, so that so there's that industrial legacy, but then there's also these these what I want to call it em, environmental injustices that also occurred. Or, or to harken back to the previous panel, in terms of cities being systematically divested from and um, being neglected. So you have a place like Newark that yeah was one of the, the earliest industrial cities in the country. I think Newark had their 350th anniversary mm -hmm. last year, so it's a pretty old city. Um, on the Passaic River, which was a major mm -hmm. corridor, which is the largest Superfund site in the country. And there's all these industries, including um, industry that made um, Agent Orange, that were located in the city of Newark. And so as a result, we have this toxic legacy because all of this stuff was allowed to be developed and all of this commerce allowed to be established before there was ever an EPA or a New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. Mm -hmm. So as a result of that, we're, we're dealing with this, this toxic legacy that sort of moved into this, um, this, this environmental racism and um, economic um, disenfranchisement so it was like it's like an overlap. It's, it started off as one thing, and then you had issues of, of white flight and um, urban divestment, and it just made it worse. And the thing is, when you leave these communities like that, when you leave communities made up of people who are disproportionately people of color, disproportionately low income, disproportionately people who speak English as a second language, disproportionately undocumented, uh, these industries seek out these types of communities, not only because the industrial zoning already exists there, but because they know the barrier to entry is going to be so much lower. These people are too busy trying to get from Monday to Tuesday to be worried about what's going on at the next council meeting. And so um, I think that that's a, a big thing that um, we have to understand about how these uh, communities get identified. It's not just about, you know, People trying to, oh, well, they have an industrial area. No, these, they know when they come to certain neighborhoods who's going to show up at these city council me meetings and make us think about stuff. Most of the time in environmental justice communities, by the time people find out about something, it's too late to do anything about it. And they don't even have the, the knowledge or education about how to get involved in the system anyway to, to stop it. Um, real quick, the New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance, you see our mission statement here. One of the main things we're concerned about is air quality. We focus a lot of our capacity on air quality issues and, and the impacts related to air quality, and that's why we work on the goods movement, particularly around concerns around diesel. Diesel has been classified as a carcinogen by the World Health Organization, not the FDA, but the World Health Organization. And so more and more diesel is being attached to all different kinds of diseases from 
obviously respiratory diseases to, to lung cancer. When I say respiratory, I'm more so asthma. And, and in Newark um, in particular, like the, the rate of asthma around child, for children is four times higher than the state, which is about 27%, and the state is 10%. So it's, um, it's a big issue. Lung cancer, uh, heart disease, I don't know if I said kidney failure, but all of these all of these things more and more are being correlated to to diesel um, environmental health impacts. And as a part of our work, because we can't do anything uh, as an island, we belong on coalitions. So these are multi-sector, multi-discipline coalitions. Our New Jersey one or um, local one is the Coalition for Healthy Ports, and we work on things such as um, policy proposals and having meetings with the Port Authority and our, our local EPA office and things like that to try to pressure them. First of all, to, to, to let them know people are watching them. That makes them scared because people don't like to be embarrassed. Um, and so I think that that's a big imp important thing um, is that in keeping people accountable is that they, the politicians and, and public agencies don't like to be embarrassed. And so they know we're watching and they know that if they do something more than likely we'll say something about it. We had a big story in the Village Voice, I think, last year that they didn't like because it was a little kid with a with a medical mask on, about talking about um, asthma. So also, we belong to the Moving Forward Network, which is a national network of people who live in these types of communities that are being impacted by the movement of our goods. And um, it gives us a, a more bird's eye view of understanding the issues, not just our localized issues, but from a national perspective so that we can speak with a more unified voice and also we can learn best practices from people who are maybe at a different stage of the experience than we are. Um, for instance, we had, for lack of a better term, like a come to Jesus moment when we were at one of the convenings and uh, a piece of literature from the Moving Forward Network classified liquid natural gas as a bridge fuel and the people for, from Houston were not having it. They, this is not a bridge fuel for us. We live here now. Like, this is affecting us now. And so it, it really, uh, being from New Jersey, that's not necessarily an issue that we talk about, but I'll never forget it from being in the room with those people and how passionate they were about, like, what, what do you, this is not appropriate. Like, this is not a bridge fuel for from our communities. This is something that's killing us now. So um, people might just be looking at emissions numbers but you're not looking at the extraction, extraction method and what that means for the human beings who live there uh, now. So it's a big deal. And, and lastly, when I say we, we, you know, we're not an island, everything that we do is a collective effort um, trying to find common ground with, with individuals in different sectors so that it can strengthen our voice. So, we work with people in government. Before the current mayor Nor got elected into office, uh, I coordinated in partnership with, with all of our organizations here um, a mayoral forum specifically on the environment. And that, that was hard in Newark because there's a lot of stuff going on contentiously with the public schools and everything. And to restrict these elected officials to be like, you know, we're going to have a whole conversation just about the environment. And then, so that, that was the first time that ever happened in Newark. And then we just had a conference on Friday in Newark at actually Rutgers Law School called um, Ports, our Public Health in Our Ports. And so we, we're, we're doing stuff like that with EOC, and these are occupational sciences, uh, physicians, and things of that nature. And so that's important that we have research and academia to give us um, strength. Then we do community stuff like these. Are, this is a truck count. Um, when you see the community picture, we were on the corner and a lot in neighborhoods in Newark, we do that sometime where we count trucks for like an hour or two hours. These neighborhoods that are in big truck corridors because a lot of times um, to bring attention to the issues, you have to be able to quantify it. So sometimes on certain corners, deep, deep, they can count like 100 trucks. And that's in people's neighborhoods and sometimes that's by schools or by hospitals or dialysis clinics. And, different things like that. And then this is a photograph from us in Houston about six months before the hurricane, um, the Moving Forward Network. So this is all of our national partners who work on this stuff together, uh, coming to Houston to do a toxic tour 
and to learn from the people in Houston, Tejas and Houston Air Alliance about the different things that they're dealing with. And, and it, it's just, it was just really um, a major revelation for me because I, you know, I never been in Houston and I never seen those refineries. And then to have the hurricane happen six months later was, was a big, um, it all made sense, let's just say that. Thank you so much, Nicole. That's really fascinating to bring a, a different perspective on the transportation conversation. Um, next, we're going to have Johanna Cockburn speak about her work at NCDOT. Thank you. Thank you. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. Um, I've, I'm sorry. I'm, okay. That should not be a problem. I'm quick. Um, I really do appreciate the opportunity to be with all of you today. Um, the importance of transportation and active transportation specifically in the framework of sustainable places could not be more critical and more timely. So let me get us uh, started. So just to give you a sense of why I think biking and walking is so important in our communities is that um, it is the original form of transportation. Uh, walking is part of every trip you make, even if you're using a car or some other conveyance. So walking is critical. Being able to do that safely is even more important. And in our communities here in North Carolina, we continue to see um, bicycling and pedestrian deaths occurring at an unacceptable rate. Um, our bike uh, fatalities are down from 2017, which is great news. Uh, but our pedestrian fatalities continue to go up. And this isn't just a problem in North Carolina, it is nationwide. So that's one of the issues I'm working on, not only here in North Carolina, but with my partners and counterparts across the country to address. The rates of, of biking and walking are up considerably, but we have to be able to make those things safe for people to be able to do them, the things that they want to do. Biking and walking also have an important support role in our economies. Uh, we just completed research this year on the economic impact of shared use paths, greenways. Uh, for every dollar that we spend constructing greenways in our communities, we get an annual return of $1.72 in economic activity every single year. Now, if you can find me another investment that makes that kind of return, you let me know. Because <laughs> even roads don't do that. One of the things that we've touched on uh, that out of Nicole's presentation that's really important is our ability to have healthy lifestyles. And the CDC predicts that in not the very far future, more than half of the adult population in the US will be considered obese. We have to do something different. And finally, transportation equity, again, a really good tie to the um, first presentation, is so critical. In our communities, there are 100,000 households that don't have a car. And in a state like North Carolina, that is a real, not just an inconvenience, but it is a real barrier to economic um, mobility, to uh, education, to being able to live out your daily needs of life. So our infrastructure has built us into that set of circumstances and we need to make different investments if we want to see a different outcome. And then finally, the other side of that coin is that when um, they survey um, folks all across the country, um, six in 10 people say that they drive because they do not believe they have an alternative. So we need to do a better job of delivering the kinds of projects that people want need and will use so that we can have the lifestyles that we all want here in our state. What it comes down to is this. Great places are sustainable places. And sustainable places have great mode choices, modes that are interconnected, modes that help you make decisions and give you choices about how you travel. <coughs> And transportation plays a really important part of the sustainable framework in a community. It ties to things like economic opportunity, 
It relies on our development patterns and those individual development decisions that get made in our communities. Uh, it helps support diverse demographics so that people have the opportunities that they need, um, as well as creating opportunities for better resiliency. Uh, some of the first panel's discussions about the impacts of flooding, um, providing things like greenways in those places are a great way to um, provide opportunities for places to flood, for floodwaters to go, and still have transportation choices. So in my mind, a sustainable transportation framework really looks at three big buckets. The first is safety, and it should always be safety first. Um, we need to be able to move around in the ways we want to get around in the safest way possible. But systems have to provide choices. And right now, as those earlier slides show, we don't have a lot of choices in our communities. And that's driven by access. And that's those fine-grained decisions about how we build our communities and the places we live, work, and play. And this topic is so interesting to me because of the interconnectedness between the federal government, who has on this slide, is the big cog because they provide the biggest pot of money to build out our system. So they have the most money, they get to set the rules, they set some of the priorities, and they set some of the standards that we have to respond to at both the state and local level. From a state perspective, we provide money too. We develop programs that meet the federal rules and are delivered really at the local level. Uh, we also are responsible, for, in many cases, for delivering a lot of the projects that improve our networks. And then finally, at that local level, it really is critical that local governments, counties, are part of the funding solution, that they are part of the um, built environment solution, and are delivering projects that work in conjunction with all those other things. So I'm happy to be here on this panel today and really look forward to the other parts of the conversation. Thanks, Nicole and Johanna. That, those are both really interesting. Um, like Nicole, um, um, I'm, I represent a community advocacy organization. My name is Karen Ringe. I'm the executive director of um, kind of a smart growthy organization. I'm going to say kind of because we're a little bit unique in the issues that we um, address. We formed over a decade ago, um, really out of the reality, um, with a group of citizens who were sitting around a kitchen table who set, had recognized that we are one of the fastest growing places in the country. And um, in fact, uh, Wake County, which is the cap, for those of you who are not from here, we're the capital county of North Carolina, and we are the second fastest growing county in the whole country. For those over a million, we're growing by more than 64 people a day. And that is sort of the basis of our framework of how we look at things. Um, and our ultimate goal really is to develop public policies at the local and the state and even the federal level that will help us plan for this growth in ways that are sustainable, that promote healthy and equitable communities. So um, it's um, a little different lens, and it doesn't apply everywhere because not all communities are growing as fast as we are, but it is certainly one that we've been addressing or, or dealing with here for some time. Um, we focus mostly at the municipal and county level in terms of um, the advocacy that we do and, and the folks that we talk to at the county commission, school board, uh, mayor, city council level. But we also do talk with uh, state legislators when we think we can make, make any progress with them. Uh, we work with um, state departments like DOT, and we even talk to folks in Congress as well as, they, as the decisions they make um, impact our community. So really from the beginning, we identified what were the key issues that um, affect, that growth is affecting here in Wake County and really the greater triangle. And certainly transportation, if you ask anybody on the street, the first thing when they talk, they're concerned about when they talk about growth is transportation. In their mind, it's mostly about too many cars and too much traffic, but we take, we're, we're coming again from sort of a sustainability lens of how can we create, not just address traffic, but do it in a way that is, uh, more sustainable and healthier. 
We're also looking at long-term water supply. Um, we are certainly looking at land use and how we're and how we how our growth and development actually affects um, sustainability and how it interacts, in particular, with transportation. And um, but we also have been looking at public schools, and we so we're taking. We're, we're not just looking at environmental issues because for us, we're, we're the actually the, now the 15th largest school system in the whole country. We are growing rapidly. Um, used to be by thousands a year. We're now growing by almost 1,000 a year of students. And we've got to address that because in many ways, that's really um, one of the um, key drivers of growth in the economy in our community and, and also the opportunity for creating opportunity for all. Um, some of, just very quickly, some of the issues that we address are our long-term water supply. In the case here, policies that affect Jordan and False Lake. Um, certainly ways to protect our drinking water, improving water quality. Uh, again, as I mentioned, supporting public schools and particularly building schools, renovating schools, but also making sure we have the resources we need for strong teachers and strong school, school facilities. Supporting a vision of Trans of multimodal transportation choices. So um, I love um, Janda's slides. Uh, really, bike ped is something we, we get. Uh, probably our biggest efforts have really been around expanding public transit. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. But we understand that having transportation choice and options not only are important for, per, for helping us deal with future traffic issues and getting some cars off the road, we hope, eventually, but also um, creating transportation choices that are going to be healthier and um, also provide more economic opportunity for everyone. We are encouraging policies that encourage smart growth um, and walkable communities, uh, including safe routes to schools. We want to see more kids walking and biking to schools as well. And actually, by doing that, we're really creating healthier communities everywhere, particularly by promoting complete streets policies, transportation policies. And now we're also working on affordable housing because with growth, uh, one of the, um, depending on how you look at it, but really one of the challenges is that um, housing costs have really skyrocketed and housing is becoming increasingly more expensive for everyone. Um, and we, so we are looking at how we can address affordable housing as a growth policy as well as an equity and quality of life one. So we like to think that we're taking a big vision um, we're not the only organization working on these issues, but certainly our difference is that we're working at the local level. Right now, as you know, we're not making a lot of progress in Congress and even in this North Carolina legislature, so we feel like we actually have some of the best opportunity for change working with municipal and county government. And how do we do that? We speak up with elected officials. We encourage um, public participation in decision making, community engagement. We um, hold community forums like this one on hot topics that we think are really relevant to actually engage the community and educate decision makers. We talk to the media and tell them what we think and, and give them tips on what's happening. We do grassroots outreach around the community. And we do also hold, um, like Nicole's group, we hold every year nonpartisan candidate forums to, because we think in the process we're educating voters and we're also raising the issues that we think are really important to the community. And of course, we're very active on social media. We encourage you to follow us. Uh, and this year, we were actually we're, um, identified as one of the 60 influencers in North Carolina. So that's been um, a real honor. And finally, I just wanted to end in terms of transportation. Uh, from the very beginning of our organization, we recognized that the biggest, one of the biggest areas, biggest things that we were really lacking as a community. We've got great universities. We've got jobs. We've got strong public schools. We've um, uh, we've got a relatively decent greenway network and open space, but the main thing we really didn't have is a strong public transportation system. So we've been following this issue for many years, talking with elected officials, going to the community, talking about the need for it. And finally, we were able to, in 2016, um, get a referendum passed in Wake County following what Durham and Orange counties had done to dedicate a funding source to expand public transit. And Wake Up Wake County served as the convener and the campaign manager for the Moving Wake County Forward Transit Referendum campaign. And one of the ways we did this is we, for years, built a coalition of a very diverse range of organizations that recognized we needed trans public transit for a whole host of reasons. <clears throat> uh, and then through a lot of hard work and working in collaboration with elected officials um, and more, we were actually able to win a transit referendum campaign 
And so now this, this half cent sales tax primarily is funding a 10 year uh, significant trans transit expansion in the Triangle and uh, we are not doing that. Our friends at Go Triangle and Go Raleigh and others are actually doing the work, but we actually helped advocate to make sure it happened. And um, that's it. I'll go next. Um, I'm Ellen Beckman. I'm a senior transportation planner for the City of Durham's Transportation Department. So uh, welcome to Durham students. Uh, we, I work for you. And uh, based on the questions in the first panel, I expect I, I get a lot, a lot of questions. <laughs> I'm excited. Um, the city's transportation department handles a you know variety of transportation um, issues in the. <laughs> Sir, you tried. A variety of um, transportation services, um, the signs and signals, uh, markings on the street, uh, run and go Durham. Um, taxi cab administration, transportation planning, um, all kinds, of th all kinds of things that you can think of that have to do with transportation come through my department. Um, yeah, well, I'll get to that. Um, so there's a few, there's a few things that we're working on that I want to highlight related to the topic of this panel. Um, the first thing is Vision Zero Durham, which is a safety initiative uh, that that the, the, the um, approach is, is that you know, no fatalities are acceptable on our transportation system and that we should be prioritizing safety and doing what we can to systemically uh, address safety issues and reduce those fatalities. Um, on average, 23 people die in Durham County on the streets every year. Um, and we are, you know, looking at where those hotspots are and looking at ways that we can proactively uh, address safety issues. Um, one way that we do that that is very visible and that a lot of people comment on are the road diets or um, restriping of roads. Um, those who live in Durham may have seen Broad Street or South Roxburgh Street, Main Street, um, Durham Chapel Hill Boulevard. Um, all places where there were there were either really wide lanes or more lanes than were needed, and we um, look at opportunities to restripe the roads, to add bike lanes, and narrow the lanes. Um, they look like bike projects only, but they really are traffic safety projects as well. Um, we have a lot of evidence that shows that those reduce speeds, and therefore reduce crashes and the severity of crashes. Um, so the second thing I want to talk about is kind of the new mobility area, uh, dockless bike share and scooters. Um, have you guys ridden on the orange and green bikes? Yeah. So those are the doc that's the dockless bike share system. Uh, it's kind of a new technology that started uh, in Durham about a year ago where you can check out a bike, ride it, drop it anywhere. Um, these are independent companies that operate them through a permitting process by the city. And um, it's, it's very interesting. It's like, an, you know, it's a, the latest thing that is happening um, and that they are now evolving into scooters. So you probably, if you've been to Raleigh, you've seen the scooters moved out downtown. Uh, and I think all the companies are finding that scooters are more profitable than bikes. So they'll be, uh, they're kind of positioning themselves to be more scooter share companies. Uh, within the last month, our city council modified our ordinance to permit scooters. Uh, we have to go through the process of reissuing the permits, but scooters are likely coming to Durham. Um, and they do offer, you know, in a lot of ways, a, a lot of benefits. If, if fewer people are driving, more people are using these dockless bikes or scooters, uh, there's fewer parking spaces that we need, um, fewer hopefully fewer fatal crashes, <laughs> um, but the, really the, the evidence is still to be, still being collected on that. Um, and, you know, just a more sustainable form of transportation. Um, I guess I should say, if those of you who are law students, there are a lot of really interesting legal issues associated with the scooters. Um, <laughs> yep. Like what they are <laughs> under state law and how they should be regulated. 
how they should be registered, what equipment they have. Um, it's really still not determined, but they're operating yeah. here in Durham, or not here in Durham, but here in North Carolina um, under some sort of legal way. <laughs> <laughs> um, then in Durham, the other thing I want to talk about is just downtown issues. Uh, downtown is really growing. You know, that was mentioned on the first panel how different Durham is now than it was 10 years ago. Uh, we have, you know, more congestion downtown than, than we've had in decades, I guess, since the tobacco factories were all booming. And um, our, our road system downtown is, has, was set up really to facilitate traffic to and from those big factories. Uh, there are a lot of one-way streets. Uh, people find them confusing. Uh, people see them as barriers to economic growth and to um, bicycle and pedestrian traffic. Um, so there's a lot of interest in changing those. Uh, we are starting a downtown study um, very soon to look at a long-range vision for those corridors. Uh, so you sh if you live in Durham, hopefully you'll be hearing about that soon. Um, we also hope to look at the Durham Freeway, which um, was also mentioned in the first panel and has a you know history of, of a sorted history in Durham of uh, bisecting the community and destroying the um, Haytai community. And um, it also really serves as a barrier today. If you try to walk across it or from north to south, there's very few places you can cross and those that you can are really um, kind of auto-oriented, usually at interchanges. And um, what can we do today to, to make sure that to modify that road so that it's less of a barrier than it has been historically. Um, the other thing I want to mention about downtown is that on Monday, the city received a million dollar Bloomberg US Mayor's Challenge Grant to look at ways that we can use behavioral science to get people to change their behavior related to commuting. Um, to kind of encourage people to walk and bike and take public transit more. Um, we've, we actually were working with a Duke Center for Advanced Hindsight on that, and the goal of the grant is to expand that work and reduce the number of cars downtown by 5% or 800 vehicles. And I want to make sure that that number, 800 vehicles, you know, and a $1 million grant, I want to um, compare that to another project that we're working on, which is building a new parking garage <laughs> um, at Morgan and Man Mangum Street. You may have seen it. It's a $23 million project to build 667 parking spaces. So maybe we can use a million dollars to reduce 800 commuters, or we can build use $23 million to build a 660 space parking garage. Um, one hopefully will be a better investment than the other. Um, That's $38,000 of space. Yeah. That's so, yeah, I, I mean, the city has the challenge of trying to encourage and move us towards a more sustainable development pattern while still um, serving people today and the growth and transportation patterns that we have today. So um, it's a challenge. Sometimes they're not always mutually uh, compatible or consistent with each other. Um, we are building a lot of projects, and I want to make sure everyone knows that. I know we have a long, long way to go, but um, I counted this morning. We have um, at least 22 projects in development that include sidewalks and at least eight that include new bicycle facilities, including one that one of those bike projects includes 10 roads. So, so nearly you know, 20 plus uh, roads that we're working on to build sidewalks or bike lanes in Durham. And um, three big greenway projects. Uh, I think I've worked for the city about 12 years and this is more projects than we've ever worked on. Um, so we are really trying to make progress there. Um, and then lastly, I want to mention equity again. Um, 
like the first panel, uh, equity is a very important issue to the city. Uh, right now with the revitalization, there's a lot of concerns that it's not reaching all parts of our city and not all residents are benefiting. And um, there's an increased effort on affordable housing and making sure that our, our transportation projects improve the quality of life but don't result in displacement and um, rising property values where the people who live there today can't benefit from those improvements. Uh, the Durham Beltline is an example of that. Uh, it is a abandoned rail corridor that the city recently bought uh, with help from NCDOT, thank you. And um, we plan to turn it into a greenway project. Uh, through the planning process, there is a lot of concerns about equity and uh, will it result in even more gentrification near downtown. Uh, this, when the city council approved the master plan, there was a commitment to create a racial equity plan to look at those issues and we are working on it. Um, hopefully it will be a template for future projects. And I will conclude with that. <laughs> Turn over to Patrick. <clears throat> thank you, Ellen, and, and thank you, everybody else. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. My name is Patrick McDonough. I'm the manager of planning and uh, transit-oriented development for Go Triangle. Go Triangle is the regional public transportation provider. We have seven providers in the region. If you've how many people have seen the green buses going around? Okay, that's us. Good, most of you. Um, so, uh, I think what we've heard today on the panel here is that we're in, I think, a, an interesting transitional moment um, when we think. And this topic was. Um, uh, the questions here talk about sustainable urban futures. So my remarks are going to kind of try to target on that. Um, I heard someone say recently that we're seeing the reassertion of early 20th century land economics, which were actually the economics of land for all of our history with a sort of suburban interlude in the mid to late 20th century. And I think if you look at what's going on in downtown Durham, downtown Raleigh, but even smaller and medium-sized cities that are not growing as fast as Raleigh and Durham are, um, we're seeing sort of return to the center, both in terms of businesses, uh, residential employment. Um, and so that is creating demand for new types of mobility, like we see with the scooters, uh, greater demand for walkability. Um, but it's also creating some of the tensions that Ellen um, and uh, Nicole shared Thank you. Uh, earlier. And so um, I guess my, my role here, I think, is what does is, what is transit play into that? Um, let me talk a little bit about who rides transit, because sometimes if we forget about that, we get the discussion wrong from the start. Um, first of all, transit is largely a young, pe a young people's game. If um, you look on our uh, surveys of people who ride all the buses in the triangle, you will find that we are, I think, 50% under 35 and 70% under 45. And so um, from the point of view, uh, sometimes in public meetings, um, there will be an older member of the community who will oppose a transit plan and say, I don't know anybody who's going to use this transit. And it's like, that's not your fault. <laughs> that's because most of your friends like you are retired, but have you talked to your kids? Because your 22-year-old daughter may be a roommate of somebody who relies on transit to get to their job or to education. And when we look at the, the types of trips that people are making in the region are younger cohort generationally in the triangle. Um, the two number one purposes are one, a job, and second, education. So these are folks who I, I think are sort of in the workforce or pre-workforce, uh, preparing people who are trying to make their way in the world and people are preparing to be successful in that endeavor. Um, and so we look at transit through that lens. And um, most of the work I do takes a very long time. I've been involved in sort of what we would call long range, high capacity transit planning. That's planning for things like commuter rail, bus rapid transit, and light rail. Um, the plans that Karen talked about, they, Wake Up Wake County did a great job helping uh, you know, kind of strike enthusiasm to vote for those plans. My team carries those out in developing those projects. But w what do they do? I mean, right now we have the growth challenge that Karen described, uh, 64 people to, to Wake County every day. Uh, don't sleep on Durham. There will be 20 new people living in Durham tomorrow morning. Um, so Durham, while not growing as fast as Wake, is growing quite fast and faster than most of the rest of the United States as well. Um, we don't see that letting up. So what that means is that um, we have a lot of centers that provide jobs, education, and healthcare, and we're trying to connect them in our communities. Um, 
one of the biggest projects I work on here in Durham is the Durham Warren Flight Rail, and to try to just put some of the travel time challenge of growth in, in a context um, for you. Uh, we, how many folks have ever used Google Maps and you get the red for congestion when suddenly traffic slows down? Great, okay. So um, you can actually buy that data. We buy that data in bulk from the people who track the congestion every year. And we've noticed that between uh, Manning Drive near UNC Hospital and near uh, 15501, just north of Duke Hospital, that we've been losing a minute in travel time, or it's been getting longer every year since uh, about 2014. So a minute a year, basically Durham and Chapel Hill are going a minute further apart every year out in the future. We, we look at the Raleigh-Durham side, and we're going about two and a quarter minutes apart, and it's really killing our express buses on I-40 and NC-147. Um, and so we've had to add fleet, not to expand service, but just to keep up with running them every 20 minutes. Um, so, but the other reason why this is important for the equity lens is that when we, um, Harvard did a great article a couple years ago, and I, when I have PowerPoint, I usually just quote it directly, because it said, uh, the single, uh, number one variable in predicting how an individual can climb out of poverty is commute time. The places with shorter commutes got people out of poverty faster because if you're in a place where you have a thick labor market and you have uh, 20,000 jobs that you can get to that match your skills, that's all right. But if you can get to 70,000 jobs that can match your skills, the likelihood that you will match for a job and be able to use your talents and reach your potential is much higher. But didn't that study also say the single most solution is access to frequent public transit? I, 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 I think I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't. I was going to use that point too. Well, that's, I mean, <laughs> but, but this is where, the, part of what we're doing is, is exactly the, the strategy that Karen is suggesting is that um, where we're losing a minute of travel time every year, we're trying to build a high capacity transit network that is basically not subject to that phenomenon. So the light rail in Durham and Orange counties, bus rapid transit in Wake County, and commuter rail connecting the, the two major urban centers of Durham and Raleigh. Those infrastructure investments are being designed to not be in traffic, so that if we can get somebody uh, to 60,000 jobs along the light rail today and 80,000 jobs along the light rail tomorrow, as more people move here, we won't degrade the access of people to those facilities. Um, so uh, let's put that in a more specific example. One of the, the things that, um, you know, Ellen talked a bit about uh, the Durham Freeway. One of the things that we are trying to do, for example, with the Durham Orange Light Rail Project is trying to connect some communities that were separated um, from opportunity by that investment. So um, I thought it was one of the most exciting days in our agency when we figured out how to get light rail to be extended down to North Carolina Central University. Because now we'll have Duke, UNC, and NCCU on the, on the same line. But when you think about what that access means for somebody who lives in East Durham, East Durham is where the mayor's, uh, Mayor Bell's poverty initiative on census tract 1001 was located, four of the lowest income census tracts in Durham County, which are less than half the median income, are right near the NCCU station. Right now, if you live in that neighborhood and you match well for a job at sort of the suburban employment center of Patterson Place out near I-40, it's uh, about 57 minutes, hour and 10, 15 minutes, one way to get from that neighborhood to Patterson Place. Light rail is going to cut that by 20 minutes each way. So save 20 minutes in the morning, save 20 minutes in the afternoon, and then, of course, it's not congested, so it's reliable. So your boss is not going to experience you, hey, you were a little bit late for work yesterday because the transportation system wasn't reliable. But if you had the, if, if a low-income individual has that 40 minutes back a day, um, that's something where they could be more involved in helping a child with homework. They could be volunteering with a community organization. They could make it to Wednesday night church supper and be more connected to their community at a local interpersonal level. So those are the things that we think regionally connected transit can do. Um, I think the other piece, um, I really enjoy seeing Hannah's uh, presentations on bike ped because one of the things when we talk about sustainable cities is I want to make this point. If you get everything else I say to the, remember this, nothing scales like walking. <laughs> all right? All the infrastructure we need to make walking work, I mean, generally we have to work on like doing better for strollers and wheelchairs and our Americans with Disabilities Act, but generally we're all wearing two renewable energy vehicles on our feet today. Um, we don't have to take them into the shop too often. Um, so walking scales, but what transit can do is transit can put uh, sort of a string of pearls where you might have places where, in the triangle today, I think transit use is about 2% in Wake County, 4 or 5% in Durham, and about 9% in Orange County. We want to grow places where 15 to 20% of people take transit, but 25 to 50% of people walk and bike. And that's where bicycling, um, walking, and then sort of, as Ellen mentioned, the micro-mobility of scooters and such, um, can really get in there. I, I think the other thing 
Uh, every now and then someone talks to me like, well, I don't know if we need the high capacity transit because we're all gonna be in driverless Ubers and Lyfts. Um, and so I, I, I dug into, um, I'm, I'm a person who uses Lyft occasionally and I ride transit probably a couple times a week. Uh, so I went back into my Lyft history on my phone. My last three trips were all under 10 minutes. Uh, they all cost me like five to seven dollars and they, none of them got me more than 2.1 miles. So that's like six bucks for seven to 10 minutes of mobility, about two miles on average. Um, the regional day pass for Go Triangle is $6. It works for 18 hours. It runs on seven bus systems. Mileage is unlimited. So when we think about the cost of providing economic mobility to people up and down the income spectrum, I, I don't, I think Lyft and Uber are creative, interesting enterprises, but I don't think they scale the way walking does. I don't think they scale like biking, and they sure don't scale economically for people who are like our transit customers in that making their way from community college into the workforce or going to that first job. Um, so that's why um, we work on these investments. Um, I think the final piece of it, I mentioned my job title is Transit Oriented Development in it. Um, I caught the tail end of the, the first panel, which I thought there was some great conversation on affordable housing. Um, figuring out how we get equity into building neighborhoods up around transit is probably one of the most important questions we're going to work on in the region in the next 20 years. And across the country, too. I mean, this is going on up in Newark. It's going on everywhere uh, because of what I said about the 20th century land economics. So um, the, the one thing that we're, we're just finishing up a two-year-long study on transit-oriented development, we'll hope to be releasing our results later this month, probably around November 28th is my goal. Um, the big takeaway on affordable housing is that there's no silver bullet. There's no one thing. There's like 40 things you need to do. Mm -hmm. And we also need to try things and we need to not be afraid to fail. We need to try three or four different things in Durham and three or four different things in Chapel Hill, knowing that we'll learn by seeing which ones succeed and fail, which ones to replicate and which ones to leave aside and try something else. Um, the gentleman earlier mentioned the uh, accessory dwelling units in, in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Excellent point. Um, that's helping uh, bring sort of some market-based stuff on, onto the, uh, the table. Then the city's also made a great investment recently at Jackson Street with affordable units. Um, I'm gonna close up with the affordable housing and transit piece by uh, talking about everyone's favorite childhood game, musical chairs. So uh, musical chairs, basically, you're always taking a chair away and then somebody has a harder time getting in. Um, some of the best research we see right now is that uh, whether you add market rate chairs to the pool of chairs, if, if you have a bunch of you know, people of mixed incomes playing musical chairs, and you add more chairs that are available at any price, more people will sit down. Um, if you have sort of subsidized chairs, or call them affordable chairs, that are only allowed for people at lower incomes in the game of musical chairs, um, more people will still get to sit down. So I think in our big debates, we can build this high capacity transit network, we can help get people access to jobs, education, and health chair, and we need to have more chairs for everybody to play in the game. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. That was really great. Um, just to sort of recap, I feel like it, it helps me to think about all the issues that we've just touched on. Um, we talked about uh, the transportation of goods and the pollution impacts. Um, we talked about the benefits of bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure, uh, alternative dimensions of growth, the economic dimensions of growth, um, as well as Durham issues in particular. Um, uh, and Patrick just finished up talking about um, the social dimensions and the, uh, the demographic challenges and questions associated with transportation development. Um, and so I think there are so many ways we could go with our Q&A, um, but I wanted to open it up to the floor and see um, if anybody has any, any questions that could maybe link these themes together. Hi, um, my name is Tisfia Naim. I'm a master's candidate at the Nicholas School of the Environment here at Duke. And so I was really pleased um, that you mentioned the $23 million parking lot. Uh, <laughs> something I think about a lot because my favorite hair salon closed down and they blamed it on the construction of that parking lot. And the like ethical clothing store in downtown that I would go to also closed down and they said they're not getting the foot traffic they needed to actually sustain their business. 
And so I love all of the different like transportation like uh, like programs that the transportation department is pursuing, but when we are also pursuing things like these parking lots and like minimal minimum parking standards for the affordable housing that's proposed downtown, how can we make it more compatible with our transportation oriented goals? Um, <laughs> I mean, this is our the house start here. <laughs> This is a, this is a huge challenge. You know, we um, we hear from both sides that uh, people want more walking, biking, uh, transit facilities. We are working on those, but then we also hear from the existing businesses that they need more parking and that they can't survive without that. Um, and uh, you know. <laughs> It's hard to say, you know, I, it's, each is an individual decision and the, you know, politics and decision makers get to decide what we end up doing. Um, the parking garage was seen as a big need, you know, about a few years ago and we moved forward with it. Um, since then, we were kind of hoping that it's our last parking garage, you know, hopefully that we can implement some of these new things and reduce the need for the next parking garage um, in downtown. Um, also, I, I do want to note that the city does not have uh, minimum parking standards downtown. Uh, we're, we haven't had that for a long time. I don't even know when. It's been as long as I worked for the city. Um, it was, you know, implemented at a time when downtown was really dead. And as an incentive to get more development downtown, there's, there hasn't been any minimum parking um, standards downtown. Um, other parts of Durham there are, though. Um, so we could, we hope to work on that um, near the future light rail stops to implement uh, reduced or no parking um, requirements in those areas. Um, what else do I want to say? Can I, can I add something on the parking requirement real quick? Since you mentioned, uh, Ellen's right, there's no parking requirement downtown, but you talked about affordable housing requirements. So let's talk about where that might be coming from. That, would, that might be the North Carolina Housing Finance Agency. So the state agency that rewards the tax credits has something called a QAP, I think it's a Qualified Allocation Program. And um, five years ago, if it was uh, near a rail line, you got negative points. Um, and so uh, for the project in downtown Durham that the city just got their low-income housing tax credits for, several of us actually wrote letters to the Housing Finance Agency multiple years in a row asking them to remove the negative criteria for being next to the railroad so that we could try to get that, that site downtown. So part of the reason why that worked out was because we had different government agencies writing to them, asking them to relax their constriction of rules. So what's possible, um, we know that a, an issue with other affordable housing around transit in Durham is going to be um, requirements that were written for a statewide context for affordable housing. Um, and so uh, our team has started to work with uh, the Durham Housing Authority, we're going to go out and like count actual car ownership at DHA properties, which we believe will be well below what the state requirement is, and we're going to try to bring that to them okay. um, to and get them to incentivize them to have evidence to say, okay, we can relax our requirement to help make it easier for an affordable housing developer not to be required to build parking that will make it harder for them to build their units. So um, from the law perspective here, this is a great example of where Ellen's right, you have a downtown, no parking required local zoning ordinance interacting with a state ordinance that says, well, you've got to build parking statewide, even though conditions in Durham might be very different from a more suburban or rural county. Mm -hmm. And a lot of, you know, a lot of downtowns still have a parking requirement. So they're gonna, they're being forced to build the big parking decks because to build the building, they have to build so many parking spaces, so. And, um, and, and I mean, honestly, so much of this is, it is about our, I mean, that's why I'm so excited about the Bloomberg grant you got, because it really is about our, our choices. You know, you're, you may take the bus downtown or take a scooter or a bike, but so many people still can't envision themselves doing that. Um, it, it's, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's going to take a generational change and people making those personal choices to choose different, different options and I really think it is so much generational that and I think the the ability to see yourself doing those things 
because they feel safe and practical and possible. Mm -hmm. And our built environment doesn't really support that today. Hi, uh, Gary Yander, a um, older Durham resident. Um, and I, I'd like to just talk about comprehensive triangle planning, because I think that on at least two levels, uh, we don't really have that. Um, you know, we got Durham, Raleigh, and, and uh, Chapel Hill that are not connected, are not planning on being connected by the light rail. That's a real concern to me. Um, getting older, would love to be able to take light rail to the airport. You know, that's not going to happen. I'd love to take it downtown Raleigh. It seems that that comprehensive interconnection would be really important for long-term development. The other thing that I think is um, that would be much easier to happen as well is we don't have uh, bicycle lanes between those three cities either um, that are safe um, and usable. Um, so I would really love to see where those are kind of in the priorities. I can speak to the first part, and then maybe Hannah can take the second. So we, we do have a comprehensive transit plan for the entire triangle. It's expressed through three county plans that are, were designed intentionally to interact with each other. So um, if you go to cities that have big, robust transit networks, and I think our, our big siblings that I always encourage everyone to look at are Seattle-Tacoma and Minneapolis-St. Paul. You notice there's a hyphen, just like Raleigh-Durham. Um, but they have similar problems because they have communities with different, it's not like Charlotte, there's one big huge downtown, it's multiple nodes. So if you go to um, both of those city regions, uh, you'll find that they have light rail, commuter rail, bus rapid transit, conventional bus service, and uh, Washington State has ferries because they're on the water. Um, what you find out is that it's important to get the right mode in the right place rather than having one mode that goes everywhere. And our transit plan is the same way. So we have light rail connecting North Carolina Central, downtown Durham, Duke, and UNC and Chapel Hill. We have commuter rail proposed for Durham to RTP to Morrisville to Cary to NC State to Raleigh to Garner. We have bus rapid transit radiating out of downtown Raleigh in four different directions connecting Garner, Cary, um, North Raleigh, and then we have bus service extended as far out to Zebulon on the east, and Hillsboro on the west, and Fuquay Verena on the south, Wake Forest on the north. So all of those things are meant to act together. So uh, no, you won't have a train that will take you, you know, from like Patterson Place or MLK in Durham all the way to Raleigh, but you will go somewhere and be able to switch on a network that's designed to work together. And I'll let Hannah talk on the bike side. Sure. Um on the biking side in particular, one of the projects we're launching in the next 12 months is a real statewide network analysis. Uh, our secretary is very interested in developing solutions both on-road and off-road that create connections between our uh, major assets in, in and across the state. So national parks, state parks, state recreation areas, our county seats. And that's going to help us get down to the level of identifying those missing pieces so we can develop out a network that really serves those purposes. The other thing I, um, I'm always impressed by is if you've ever talked to Sig Hutchinson, he has this big idea of developing a bicycle freeway that runs in parallel to I-40. He, he keeps showing me the same map. So <laughs> if you've ever talked to him, he will chew your ear off about that idea because it is a big idea and he and he has um, articulated it in a great way about how this could really be a huge um, benefit connecting the places in the triangle with some of the other assets that are so important. Um, Umstead Park, for example, is a big piece of yeah, that. And getting people in and out of the and, RTP. Yep, and exactly. The, and he's working on the funding. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, we are working on a project. Uh, Old Durham Chapel Hill Road here in Durham, uh, if you've driven on that, between Pope Road and Garrett Road is under construction today to add bike lanes and sidewalks. And it is the Durham side of a bigger project that also involves Old Durham Road. They call it Old Durham Road in Chapel Hill. We call it Old Chapel Hill Road in Durham. Um, <laughs> 
uh, to add bike lanes and sidewalks there. So that, that has been a long envisioned as part of our plan to connect Durham and Chapel Hill. Um, that being said, I also want to make sure that everyone knows that those are really expensive projects. Like, I think that is our most expensive project, and it's about, I think Durham, the, just the Durham side is $11 million. Um, yeah, but Chapel Hills is more. And Chapel Hills is more. In addition to that, um, it's essentially rebuilding a road that was once a rural two-lane, you know, strip paved road between these communities that were connected. Um, and we are, we, we want to do projects like that, but at the same time, uh, doing smaller scale projects closer to town are often more cost effective and serve more people. And um, I think the reality is that there's more people who are willing to do a two mile bike ride uh, between Duke's campus and downtown than a 15 mile bike ride to Chapel Hill or Carborough. Um, so we're, we're looking at both, but I think in, in a lot of ways, we have learned that those projects are really expensive and we can do maybe more on a more local scale. I, I wanted to add in about the money, because I, I, I don't, well, don't want to end this conversation without talking about funding. For, because if this is, if, we're, we're, if all of us here are seeking more sustainable transportation options, multimodal transportation, healthy ways to get around, um, one of, frankly, the biggest, there's two big challenges, but one clear one it has to do with funding. Um, right now, we make decisions at the state level of where our money goes with funding formulas that were agreed to by the state legislature. And no surprise, all the funding that's for public transit, bike, ped, even ferries, um, all of that is about 4% of our transportation, the mo actual money we're spending as a state on transportation. Fortunately, communities like Durham and Raleigh are, you know, are being forced, really, to put up local money, like our sales tax for transit, and finding ways, and a lot because of the communities demanding it, that they want, like you, sir, want to see more of this kind of transportation option. So they are putting some money in, but so many communities cannot afford it, particularly small towns, rural towns. Um, and, the, and what we need is a, a change in that funding formula so that more funds are become available. The Durham Orange Light Rail project is really being held hostage because of the way they have configured and put limitations on the funding that can go to that light rail project. Yeah, you're not going to, originally that light rail project was going to go all the way across the triangle, but it ha we have to have state money that goes into that. And of course, we have to have the federal money, but you can't get the federal money unless the state matches it. And so that we're, in some ways, we're, we're, we're making progress, but we've really got to lift and make a big change there. And that has to do with this concept of what are we really going to invest in for our transportation options that um, we know are good for the economy, they are good for job access, they attract businesses, and they also are creating healthier people. Yeah. Oh. I'm, I'm a non-North Carolina person, so it's hard for me to give some uh, insight to some of these questions, but I did want to just reflect on certain things I, I had not heard of that maybe some of these people could speak on, which is about car sharing, which is, I think, a more and more um, popular thing that's happening definitely in the Northeast and the tri-state area because it might be people that like commute to work during the week on public transportation, but they just want a car on the weekend to go pick up their dry cleaning and go grocery shopping or something like that. So. That's also, I think, a big, a big thing, and um, also electric vehicles um, changing the market and, and access to plug-ins, and like that's the conversation we're having in New Jersey now around Volkswagen settlement money. Um, it was about trying to get more electrification in the state, like, and um, the other thing I would caution you guys around is like, you know, pay attention to, and protect your trees. I keep hearing people talk about trees in, in North Carolina and around Durham, particularly because I, I went to a presentation, like I think last month, and a woman talked about trees. She was from Pittsburgh, and she said, like, trees are the one thing that, like, if you remove it and you try to replace it with another tree, like, you can't ever get that investment back because the amount of time it takes for a, a good tree to grow and, like, how important it is to our ecosystem, not only for, like, um, stormwater or runoff and... Um, all different kinds of th trees are, you know, I'm not an arborist, but trees are very extremely important. And 
being mindful of those buffers too, as you talk about things like um, putting bikes parallel to highways, because uh, I also mentioned at dinner yesterday at this Port and Public Health Conference on Friday, an epidemiologist got up and he referred to a, a study that was done in Germany around heart attacks. Um, and I think he said one third of the individuals who were screened were um, asked about, well, all of them were asked where were they in the hour before they had their heart attack and one third of them identify on the roadway. So that's walking on a bike in their car. And so it's, it's just really something that we should think about. Hi, I'm uh, Michelle Nolan. I teach environmental law here at Duke. And um, in all of this talk about, you know, the development and, you know, the transportation needs, uh, our big employers like Duke, like UNC, like NC State, and like all the employers in uh, the Research Triangle area, um, you know, they really d drive a lot of the transportation demand, a lot of the com commuting challenges, and so they need to be at the table uh, uh, participating and creating and supporting uh, responses to those challenges. And I personally have been really disappointed in Duke's role um, here locally uh, with drawing support for the Bull City Connector, which took people from, um, you know, it was a free uh, circulator bus that took people from campus uh, to uh, downtown and uh, um, all the way out to um, some of the newer developments in East Durham. And, uh, and now possibly blocking uh, access to uh, the, the regional uh, light rail line that would go between here and Chapel Hill. So do you have any suggestions of you know, the role that these uh, larger institutions uh, should be playing and how uh, you know, uh, employees and students here at Duke might be able to more actively engage in these types of political conversations that are going on through the community? Um, one of the, I was going to mention, uh, and it, you know, like we were talking about affordable housing, every, everything is local. And so, you know, what's the policy that's going to be appropriate for a community is going to depend on that locality. But, um, in New York, I used to work in Manhattan for a time and I remember having certain kind of incentives to utilize public transportation. If you got the money taken out of my paycheck or something like ahead of time, now I'm not paying taxes on it. Like it's, it's different kinds of, um, I think mechanisms that employers can use to incentivize their employees to uh, utilize public transportation. Sometimes there might be a health insurance um, aspect to it, whether, you know, people using Fitbits and all kinds of stuff. So it's, I think there are ways, St student discounts too. I, I, I would, I, I have to believe that the impact of Duke University is significant in just driving a lot of these decisions. and. I mean, there's no question. I mean, that just for example, with in, in, um, as we're rolling out the Wake Transit Plan, we've had multiple public engagement opportunities, and the transit agencies are counting comments. So the more that you and your colleagues and students can provide comments, such as "We want that" or "You know, we need this," it really does in significantly influence the the outcomes. Um, at the same time, they're also um, you know, I, 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 you probably know more about the Bull City Connector issue, but I know that in Raleigh, where we've got a downtown connector, which, um, and I'm sitting on the Raleigh Transit Authority, and we're actually thinking about stopping it, mostly because the you, the ridership is plunging, and a lot mostly had to do with it was a poor design, it wasn't really a trans, uh, an efficient transit design, and um, and frankly, we're going to be expanding bus other bus service. So there's, um, and there's an equity component too, because are we providing free service for, at least in Raleigh, the perception of we providing free service for bar hopping or for people who really <laughs> need it. So th that's a little different issue, but um, I, uh, bottom line is providing letters, comments, it really, meeting with the elected officials and the transit agencies is really important. I, I would say, I, I think there's, so first, on the, on the Bull City Connector, just because you're talking about the R-Line in Raleigh, um, the Bull City Connector is a very highly productive service. Um, and that's why when Michelle says there's some disappointment there, it's, it's palpable. Um, uh, Bull City Connector, Durham is a smaller city than Raleigh. Bull City Connector carried more or more than double the R-Line on any given weekday. Um, but I, I do think uh, 
getting back to some of the demographic things I talked out at the very beginning, I, I think there's a, a storytelling and an empathy piece that is probably more persuasive than the data, um, which is I do think that cohort-wise, generationally-wise, where some of the folks who are making the decisions are very far removed from the life circumstances where they can imagine themselves relying on transit to um, accomplish their daily goals. And so um, I, I would say, you know, we're at a law school, right? There are three law schools on the proposed light rail line. And one of the things that we've always thought would be a benefit to the law schools is that there's courthouses in downtown Durham. And in terms of like interning and helping people get access to being practitioners of the law, that the line becomes a vehicle not only for people to go to places where they can practice, but to have interchange with the people from the other, your common students at NCCU and UNC Law, to become a, a, a community of um, aspiring lawyers and the people who are going to lead the next generation of, of legal thought in our country. Um, but I don't know that the people who are making decisions like the decision that was made around the Bull City Connector are thinking about you or your colleagues at those other two universities. They may be thinking about, well, I live here and I commute to work this way, so if, if it doesn't work for me, it doesn't work for everybody. And um, to the gentleman who asked about the airport, I get this question all the time. The median person in the triangle never goes to the airport in an entire year. The people who go, <laughs> really, really, no, no, no. Okay, well, let's play a game. Y'all are carrying the water for all the rest let's of us. Let's play a game. <laughs> How many people went to the RDU airport one time this year? Hands up. Over five times, keep them up. Over 10 times, keep them up. Over 20 times, keep them up. We're planning the service for you. <laughs> okay, so we, we got to 20 times, we got to 20 trips to the airport and all but one hand in the room went down, okay? Now, if you have a standard American like office job, you go to work and you have two weeks vacation, you go to work 251 times a year, all right? So does the transit need to go to the place where the most heavy user goes a little more than 20 times or where a lot of people go 251 times a year? Um, and so while the airport is, I love RDU Airport. It's our window to the world. I have family in Massachusetts. I was in RDU twice last month. Um, it's a great place to fly out of. But it is also not the place that most people go. It is the place that many of our business travelers go, people who are higher income, more elite stakeholders in the region. And when I talk about the empathy piece, it's not wrong for somebody to think about their own lives when they think about, does a future transportation investment make sense for me and for the region? But when you're in a leadership role, it's incumbent for you to also think about other people's lives. And that's where it comes back to that demographic thing earlier. So uh, I would say if you guys are here to Michelle's question, don't be afraid to share what your life and transportation is like with others, especially those who are in decision-making roles. Tell them about, like, if, you, if you talk to the people who um, empty the trash in this building, ask them how they get here. And then write a letter to somebody who makes a decision, write it to the Chronicle telling them their story. That's powerful. Nicole, uh, you were at the airport yesterday. Is what Patrick's saying true? Is it a good place to fly in and out of? <laughs> Well, Nork, Nork Airport is, is an interesting airport, so <laughs> it, um, it, it gets chronically ranked as like one of the worst airports in the country, so I don't think I'm in any position <laughs> to be judging other people's airports. But what I would say is that we just started to like, I think, well, New Jersey Transit had a train going out to Nork Airport now for maybe at least five years, and now the PATH train is being extended to go out to Newark Airport, uh, coming from New York City, and more and more people are using, and like I said, it's one of the busiest international airports in the country, so people are using public trans transportation to get to the airport, but you just have to understand a population density and a level of aggression from um, not just drivers, but from law enforcement. You cannot sit at the, you, the Port Authority police are sitting there. You cannot sit there to pick people up, it probably costs $6 to park for half an hour. Like, they make it so that the only reasonable, uh, there are buses that go to the airport too, so the, the only reasonable, affordable um, option for a lot of people is public transportation. And you can take the bus to RDU, it runs every 30 minutes, and now you can even do it on Sundays, and it costs, uh, well, depending on what you're taking, what, two two twenty five. Yeah, 225 max. And uh, it goes every 30 minutes, and you can follow it on your phone. Or free if you're a Duke student. <laughs> your bus pass.
Um, so with that, uh, we're just going to break for lunch. And we hope you guys will stick around and continue to engage our panelists, ask any follow-up questions about what was shared. Um, we're going to ask if you guys can exit through this back door on the right side of the room and then loop around to grab your box lunches on the other side. Um, thank you all for being here. Thanks.